Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Marcin Vielec. I'm the habilitated doctor of the legal sciences at the Faculty of Law and Administration, Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University in Warsaw. And I am the head of the Cathedral of Criminal Procedure on this university, and I'm also director of Institute of Justice in Warsaw. I have the honor and this great pleasure to welcome you very warmly to today's event, Oxford Debate, as, as I know, which is the first ever Oxford debate on, at the Faculty of Law and Administration of Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University in Warsaw with uh, our foraging scientific partner. In our university, in our faculty, I have a honor and huge pleasure, of course, to be a tutor of the scientific circle of criminal procedure. So, this dear guest and participant, participant, let me inform that you to the events is the part of a huge research project called Central European Professors Networks 2021, in which it plays the main role Ferenc Medal Institute of Cooperative Law in Budapest. In this project, I am the head of the research group, the impact of digital platforms and social media on freedom of expression and pluralism. Generally, this event is organized with the support of our scientific circle of criminal procedure on University of Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski in Warsaw, the Ferenc Mabel Institute of Comparative Law in Budapest, and the Institute of Justice in Warsaw. Dear guests and participants, the theme of today's meeting is censorship in social networks and fake news in social networks. Two teams from Hungary and Poland will take part in the debate. My pleasure. In this debate, I am the coach of the Poland team. I think that it's very important to sufficiently explore the legal perspective on this phenomenon of censorship in social networks and fake news in social networks. The main goal of the event is draw to attention of communities of European countries and important, to important to relevant topics related to the future of Europe in the 21st century. Additionally, to the debates aim to enable the young researchers to present different visions for analyzing the impact of the fake news on the internet in relation to freedom of expression and pluralism of opinion and analyzing the impact of online censorship on freedom of expression and pluralism of opinion. The aim of the debate is to draw attention to the issue of digitalization and counteract its possible negative consequences which seem to have a greater, greater and greater impact on the development of 21st century European societies, including, of course, Central Europe. Through today's debate, we also want to draw attention to the existing benefits and threats on the ongoing digitalization of the modern world. I hope that the cooperation will bring positive results and will allow the exchange of knowledge about the legislation and legal solution existing in Poland and Hungary regarding the impact of digital platforms and social media on freedom of speech and pluralism. Ladies and gentlemen, at this moment, I would like to give the floor to the Professor Ede Shilagi, director of the Ferenc Mabel Institute of Comparative Law, today, or the coach of Hungary team, who will make the welcome on behalf of the Ferenc Mabel Institute of Comparative Law in Budapest. Professor Shilagi, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> dear colleagues, dear Polish friends. On behalf of the Ferenc Model Institute of Comparative Law, I welcome the participants of this event, the audience, and of course, the organizers. I would like to start by offering my most sincere thanks uh, and congratulations uh, to the participants, of course, and to the uh, Institute of Justice. Um, I would like to emphasize that this, that this event is part uh, of uh, uh, event series of the Central European Professors Network. This Professors Network uh, includes not merely uh, professors and senior, senior researchers, but also uh, 
younger researcher, I think uh, this idea, uh, idea deriving from Professor Vielets and uh, his team, it's a great idea uh, to, to emphasize the strong relationship between uh, our countries and our institutions. As to the topic, of course, I can share the opinion of Professor Vialets that is absolutely a fresh and uh, 21st century topic. Therefore, it's absolutely suitable to organize uh, uh, this kind of debate uh, to, to assess uh, these challenges. I think at the end of my speech, I would like to wish good luck uh, for both Hungarian and Polish team. And, uh, and yes, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, I see that uh, we are slowly approaching the big start of today's debate. So, please allow me to turn to our brave debaters from Hungary and Poland. Dear young scientists, we'll start the debate in a moment. I know there is stage fright, some fear, some adrenaline. I have it myself right now. I know there is nervousness. I feel it myself, but it is positive emotion. But I also know that everyone is brave and well prepared for the debate. I wish you accurate observation, interesting arguments, but most of all, I would like this debate to be a kind of intellectual game from which not only the final conclusion will emerge, but this debate also initiates cooperation between scientists from our countries. Of course, it's a pity that this debate is not being held in life in Budapest or Warsaw. The current times give us a lot of limitation on, but also give us a lot of technical possibility. Therefore, we had to use the remote connection between Warsaw and Budapest. Hence, we apologize maybe for any technical problems, maybe not high quality connection. Altach, I hope that there will be no such problem. So, I wish you good luck in the debate, and, to, and I would like to give the floor to Mr. Bartomi Orenja, coordinator of Center of Strategic Analysis of the Institute of Justice and doctoral student in, on University Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski Faculty in Law, uh, Faculty in Law and Administration. Bartek, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear director. Ladies and gentlemen, attention please. Here are the rules of the Oxford debate. Two main areas. The first is censorship in social networks. The second is fake news in, in social networks. Two teams, one from Poland, one from Hungary. Four speakers each, 10 minutes for each speech. Each area has four specific issues. Each specific issue is presented by one speaker from each team. Speeches are presented alternately. The order of speeches is decided by the host of the Oxford debate. Ladies and gentlemen, the rules of the Oxford debate have been presented. I wish the participants the best of luck and the audience a lot of pleasure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bartek. Thank you very much for your speech. So, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Maria Kupil, who will be the moderator towards the debate. Thank you for your attention. From my side, it's all. I wish the all participants all the best. Maria, please start the event and I confirm our debate is open. Maria, please. Thank you. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to warmly welcome you at this debate. Uh, in the beginning, I would like to introduce the team. Before that, I would like to apologize for any mistakes during the introduction, because uh, I will not hide that I have some problem with uh, fairness. So to start with the Hungarian team, I'm pleased to introduce the head of the team, Professor Janusz Szilak. The professor obtained his law degree at the University of Michigan. He has also started his science. He carries out research mainly on topics connected to environmental law and agricultural law. He is a member of board of directors of European Public Law Organization, the Hungarian Deputy Delegate of the European Detroit Group, a member of the editorial board of uh, legal issues in transdisciplinary environmental studies, uh, law in action, and who uh, Hungarian Yearbook of International Law and European Law. The next participant of the Hungarian team is Mr. Janusz Szyn. Uh, Mr. Sinek is a PhD candidate of the current Tech Doctoral School of Law at the University of Mishkolov, Hungary. After graduating from the Faculty of Law and Political Sciences of the Tasman Peter Catholic University in Budapest, he completed a postgraduate LOM course in media law. His main field of researches are media law, the law of social media, legal issues in the new media, IT law, and as well as copyright law. Mr. Shinek also works as a professional partner coordinator, a project manager in various international projects. Next participant of the Hungarian team is Mr. Marin Kovac. He's a PhD candidate of the Malcolm Giza Doctoral School of Legal Studies at the Brescian University and teaches international economic law at Sapienza University in Romania. His research focuses mainly on international investment law, but he's also interested in general international law, human rights law, specifically minority rights and a number of other topics. The next participant of the Hungarian team is Mr. Almos Kumpani. He's a PhD candidate at the Doctoral School of Law and Political Science of the Tasman Peter Catholic University in Budapest and teaches administrative law at the Tasman Peter as well. He's interested in constitutional law and administrative law, but his research focuses mainly on the topic of special legal order. The next participant of the Hungarian team is Mr. Laszlo Donfer. He's a PhD candidate at the Ferenc Beck Doctoral School of Law at Mishkolov University. He's currently employed as a researcher at the Ferenc Mav Institute of Comparative Law, Department of Public Law in Budapest. He's the co-president of the PhD section of the Hungarian Society of Criminology. His research focuses on the investigation of cybercrime, cyber criminology, and digital forensics. That uh, was the squad of the Hungarian team. And now I will introduce the Polish team. So the head of the Polish team is the professor Martin Bier, the director of Institute of Justice, a graduate of law at the Faculty of Law and Administration of the Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski in Warsaw. Um, Mr. Jelet also graduate of MBA top public executive program at the Business School, University of Navarra in Barcelona, and the National School of Public Administration Lech Kaczynski in Warsaw. The professor is uh, a prorector of the law degree at the Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University in Warsaw. 
The next participant of the Polish team is Mr. Roland Szymczykiewicz. Um, Mr. Szymczykiewicz is attorney, specialist in a panel law. He runs his own law firm in Warsaw. He's also an uh, academic teacher in the university named uh, Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski in Warsaw on law faculty. He's an author of many researches and articles about penal law and the penal process. The next participant of the Polish team is Mrs. Ewa Płocha. She's an assistant of the Department of Criminal Procedure at the Institute of Legal Sciences at the Faculty of Law and Administration at the University of Cardinal Stefan Wyszyn in Warsaw. She specializes in particular in the Japanese criminal process, in the application of modern technology, heading with uh, artificial intelligence in the criminal process. The next participant uh, of the Polish team is Ms. Claudia Uniewska. She's a Polish lawyer, a graduate of law at the Faculty of Law and Administration of the Cardinal Stefan Krzysztof University in Warsaw. She's an author of scientific articles, speaker and organizer of international and national scientific conferences. Her main interests are criminal procedure law, criminal law, human rights, and international law. And last participant of the Polish team is Mr. Marcin Rauch. He's an assistant professor at the Department of Criminal Procedure at the Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University in, in Warsaw, and also a former visiting scholar at the Italian and German universities. His research interests focus on international law, new media and elite trade in works of art. His doctorate on art crimes was recognized as the best doctoral dissertation in the field of legal sciences in Poland in 2020. Thank you. Uh, that, that was all about the team. Uh, we will have two main issues. Uh, we will start on the first one, which is legal aspects of content censorship in social networks. Ladies and gentlemen, please for attention. Now, the first speaker from Polish team, Ms. Claudia Uniewska, will describe the topic, censorship of content in social networks in Poland, legal basis of censorship in Poland, relevant international standards in Poland. Thank you. Ms. Maria, thank you very much for putting me on. Um, at the beginning of our debate, uh, it should be clarified what censorship is. We can consider censorship to control and restrict the activities of people, including but not limited to internet users, as exemplified by the restriction and control of published content by social media users. Censorship can occur for a variety of reasons. The most popular are political, moral, or legal considerations. We can distinguish between illegal censorship and also legal censorship. We can deal with illegal censorship in a situation where the legal norm is not the basis that determines uh, the scope of rights, freedoms, and penalties. Uh, on the other hand, in the case of legal censorship, the source of limitations on rights and freedoms is the law. The differencing criterion is the existence of a normative system within which there is or there is no legal basis for censorship. When trying to determine what type of content is censored on the internet in Poland, it is best to refer uh, to the most popular social networking sites. At the moment, there is no research in this area, but you can refer to the, uh, one of the most used uh, social networking sites in Poland, which is Facebook. Uh, the regulations of this social network have been translated, in, translated into the Polish language. Uh, each user who wants to use Facebook must accept the terms of use and undertake to comply with the rules set out in it. Uh, Section 3 of Facebook's regulations provides your obligation to Facebook and our community, uh, which includes, uh, among others, what you can share and do on Facebook. 
Um, one of Facebook goals is to ensure that its users can fully express themselves and share content that is important to them, but not at the expense of the safety and well-being of others uh, or the integrity of the community. For this reason, Facebook users cannot use Facebook products to perform activities or share content that violates Facebook regulation, is illegal, is misleading, discriminatory, or fraudulent, or um, violates the rights of another person, uh, including their property intellectual rights. Uh, in the event of a Polish user violated in terms of use of the regulations, Facebook may remove or block the content provided by him, by this person. Additional, uh, additional, Facebook may remove or restrict access to any of content, circuit tests, or information, including even an account, uh, as it deems necessary to avoid legal consequences. Um, in practice, this means that Facebook's provisions uh, authorize it to remove any content that Facebook deems as problematic. Uh, it is worth emphasizing that the criterion by which a given content available on the internet is assessed from the point of view of being problematic is very uh, subjective and unclear. And most often, censorship on the Polish internet concerns religious content, political views, and content that violates copyrights on the internet. The legal basis of censorship in Poland is, this, is determined by the provisions of European Union law, which has been currently implemented into the Polish legal system, as well as interpretation of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, as a member state of the European Union, Poland is obliged to take into account the, uh, um, the European Union law and adhere to judgments issued by the Court of Justice of the European Union. This is due to Poland's international legal obligations. The European Union jurisprudence system, unlike the Polish system, has a precedence character and thus influences the interpretation and application of law. Of key importance are the rulings of the Court of Justice of the European Union, which, when applied and interpretation, uh, create or specify the content of the legal norms adopted by the European Union. In the context of the law created within the European Union, it is worth mentioning the directive of the European Parliament and of the Council of May 2001 of the harmonization of certain aspects of copyright and related rights in the information of society, which is crucial for censorship on social networks. Uh, Article 1 of uh, the directive explains its cause, which includes the legal protection of copyright and related rights within the European Union internal market, with particular emphasizing on the information society. Uh, Poland has implemented uh, all legal norms contained in legal acts, an example of which is uh, the amended act on copyright and related rights. Due to this fact and the fact that in Poland, uh, this is, uh, there is currently no legal framework relating directly to the legal status of digital platforms and social media uh, or the sanctioning of unlawful censorship, it can be concluded that this is issue currently in a legal vacuum. Uh, recognizing this fact, the Polish Ministry of Justice decided at the beginning of 2021 to take the necessary steps to introduce into the Polish legal system an act that would regulate this issue. Therefore, the Ministry of Justice sent a request to the Prime Minister's office to enter the draft act on the protection of freedom of speech on social networking websites in the list of legislative works of the Council of Ministers. Um, it is worth mentioning that this new legislative initiative appears to be a direct response to the regulatory gap that exists. Uh, the draft of this law assumes that freedom of expression, speech, or pluralism will be warranted regardless of the environment in which the individual operates, including the digital, digital space. Uh, however, any uh, restrictions on the rights and freedoms of Polish internet users must be normatively justified. Uh, I'm very curious to know how this is uh, regulated in the Hungarian legal order. Thank you for your explanation. It's time to please Mr. Armas Ungwari from Hungarian team to present the topic. Censorship of content on social networks in Hungary, legal basis of censorship in Hungary, relevant international standards in Hungary. Please for your voice, sir. 
Thank you kindly for the introduction. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this event and, and for the invitation. Uh, as the first speaker, I'm going to talk about the censorship of content on social networks in Hungary regarding the legal basis of restriction on freedom of speech. As in many other countries, in the past years, also in Hungary, the argument came up around the censorship of content on social networks that requires the lawmakers to make efforts in order to regulate the online world. We believe that decisions around such matters should not be made based solely on guidelines created by the platforms themselves, but also in accordance with clear procedures and rules laid down by a law. One of the main issues is that the current measures against disinformation and hate speech might not be sufficient to counter the assault on freedom of speech. Decision makers in Hungary stress that protecting freedom of expression is a must. Freedom of speech should be the rule by its restriction exclusively an exception. We could find politically significant examples of editing and suspension of contents by a social media platform also relating to Hungary when the person's consent did not receive the appropriate justification of the restrictions or bans. There are two cases worth mentioning in Hungary. First, there was the video of Janos Lazar, in which the then minister talked about the harmful influence of migration on the city and society of Vienna. By reason of the breach of the community standards, Facebook deleted this political advert, but later it was restored. This suspension was considered an intervention in the parliamentary election campaign. The second case concerns the suspension of the Facebook profile of the president of the Hungarian radical right-wing party, Our Common Movement, which had 207,000 followers. Not much later, the public profile of the party itself, which had more than 80,000 followers, was also deleted. In addition, several media outlets have been victims of the social media's restrictive work. Considering such instances, the president of the National Authority Data Protection and Freedom of Information in Hungary suggested in August 2020 that there might be a need for legislation on social networks. This was followed by the statement of the Hungarian Minister of Justice in January 2021 that the Ministry of the Justice, in consultation with the heads of the network, with the involved state institutions, will propose a law to, to, to the parliament concerning the regulation of social networks Hungarian operation with the aim of establishing a legal, transparent and controllable functioning. However, the government later decided to wait for the regulation of the European Union in this matter. The Digital Services Act proposed at the level of the EU aims to increase the accountability of online platforms and clarify the rules about taking down illegal content including hate speech and incitement of violence. Among fundamental rights and freedoms, the Hungarian constitution provides that everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. Besides constitutional regulations, the Act on Freedom of the Press and Fundamental Rules on Media Contents is also worth mentioning. Pursuant to this cardinal act, Hungary recognizes and protects the freedom of freedom and diversity of the press which also includes independence from the state and from any organization or interest group. The limitations on freedom of expression are also regulated at the constitutional level. Under the Constitution's General Fundamental Rights Restriction Clause, a fundamental right may be restricted only in order to enforce another fundamental right or to protect the constitutional value to the extent strictly necessary and proportionate to the aim pursued by respecting the essential content of the fundamental right. Regarding freedom of expression, the Hungarian constitution lays down that freedom of expression may not be exercised with the aim of violating the human dignity of others, as well as with the aim of violating the dignity of the Hungarian nation or of any national, ethnic, racial or religious community. Therefore, all opinions, viewpoints, and expressions benefit from the constitutional pro protection on the basis of freedom of expression. The protection of freedom of expression is high priority in the Hungarian legal system, but there is no automatic primacy in case fundamental rights collide. In such cases, 
primacy must be appropriately justified, the extent of the restrictions must be in harmony with the principles of necessity and proportionality. For example, defamation is one of the most important parts of the protection of personality rights. Under the Hungarian Civil Code, expressing an opinion in a way that is capable of adversely affecting society's perception of another person, which is also unduly insulting in its formulation and misrepresents or reports untrue facts concerning another person is prohibited. And the person committing such acts may be ordered to pay damages to the victim. Hungarian laws do not contain the category of hate speech, which as a summary phrase of for hatred expressions constitutes a classical limit on freedom of expression. However, there are criminal offenses in the criminal code which cover hate speech, such as incitement against the community, the use of symbols of despotism, the defamation of national symbols, and the public denial of the crimes of national socialist and communist regimes. In addition, the prohibition of discrimination and hatred is also prescribed by the Act on the Freedom of the Press and the Fundamental Rules on Media Content. Under this Act, media content may not incite hatred against any minority or any majority and may not exclude any minority or any majority, such as any nation, community, church, religious group, national, ethnic, linguistic, or other minority. The Act contains further restrictions on the freedom of the press, prescribing that media contents shall not violate the constitutional order, as well as the exercise of the freedom of the press may not constitute or encourage any acts of crime, violate public morals, or the moral rights of others. Of course, the Hungarian National Regulation on Freedom of Expression, and especially the restrictions on this fundamental right, must be in harmony with the international obligations. Among the relevant international standards, the Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights are worth mentioning. In addition, the European law shall be applied. The Charter of the, Fu the, Charter of the Fundamental Rights of the European Union contains the right to freedom of expression correspondingly to the determination of the European Convention on Human Rights. Among the secondary legislations of the European Union, two, di two directives are worth mentioning. The Audiovisual Media Services Directive creates an EU level framework to coordinate national legislation on all audiovisual media and sets out requirements concerning aspects such as prohibition of hate speech and discrimination. The second directive is the Directive on, on Electronic Commerce that establishes harmonized rules on issues such as transparency and information requirements for online service providers. However, none of them contains relevant provisions relating to the censorship of content on social networks. As a conclusion, it can be stated that the Hungarian regulations on freedom of expression and its restric restrictions do not contain rules relating to the censorship of content on social networks. However, thanks to the experiences of the last few years, the legislative body recognized the controversy and the necessity to regulate the social networks functioning. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, sir, for your speech. I would like to please uh, Mrs. Eva Poha from Polish team to describe the topic. And it is deciding about content censorship in Poland. Criteria for content censorship in Poland. Thank you for giving me the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, first, I have to say that in recent year, social media, like for example, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, or, uh, Insta or, or Facebook have become one of the main sources of information. Their users have believed that they found the perfect place to exchange information, thoughts, and opinions, to communicate with friends, colleagues, and other people. Some of them believed that social media were a perfect space for discussion, exchange views, and the substance of free internet. However, from time to time, we heard 
that someone had been blocked for violating the rules of social platform. We usually didn't pay attention to it. Only some of us noticed that in some situations, it was nothing else than content censorship in social media. The situation has changed diametrically in 2021. The global serious discussion about the use of content censorship has finally started. Blocking all kinds of content on a grand scale has been relieved, but that's not all. The turning point, in my opinion, was blocking the account of the President of United States of America, Donald Trump, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'm not judging here his behaviors, opinions, or statements. It's not a place for this kind of discussion. The main topic is different, but it was like a thunder. It was the account of the head of the largest country in the world, account, uh, an account of the man who had access to starting code of nuclear weapon. And what happened? It was blocked by an owner of private tech company, such a powerful politician, and he couldn't do anything with it. On the other hand, in Poland, for example, Facebook had blocked many times account of Institute of, International, uh, of National Remembrance for sharing information about German crimes during World War II. All these situations are meaningful. All these situations show how important issue is content, uh, is content censorship in social media. Unfortunately, as it was explained by Claudia, there are no legal acts in Poland regulating content censorship in social media. It means that entities which own social media decide about content censorship. Precisely, web administrators and artificial intelligence make decisions, these decisions every day. And of course, it's always a risk of, or of, uh, of an errors, uh, the risk of errors and bias. We have to look carefully uh, what the, is written in uh, social platforms regulations. For example, according to Facebook's terms of service, user accounts can be suspended or even terminated in three kinds of situations. First, for breaching term or policies, including in a particular community standard, uh, standards. Second, rapidly infringing other persons' uh, intellectual property rights. And first uh, situations is regarding situation where Facebook is obligated to do so for legal reasons. It is worth paying attention to the provisions of community standards where Facebook directly admits that it limits expression in service of at least one of the following values, dignity, safety, privacy, and of course, authenticity. Explanations and definitions of these notions are too general and not always consistent with the law of users country. Community standards and terms of policies, it all sounds good and may give the impression that it aims to protect human and civil rights. But unfortunately, it is not always the case. What happened this year in Australia shows that Facebook cares about content censorship only when it's profitable. In short, Australia proposed law that originally aimed to require tech companies to pay news organizations for their content. In response for this proposed law, Facebook completely blocked Australians from sharing news stories on its platform. As it was said, as it was said by uh, Claudia, there's a draft law prepared by Ministry of Justice 
which would make it, it would make it illegal for social media companies to remove posts which uh, didn't know, uh, didn't break Polish law. Apart from that, this statute, this draft of, of statute, is very important because it will establish the freedom, uh, the, the, uh, the freedom uh, of speech council, which probably will be public administration body responsible for protecting uh, speech of freedom uh, in social media. It is obvious that regulating issues regarding content censorship in media is really hard, tough task. But first steps were taken. And I think that the uh, future will show us the result. I'm also curious how it looks in Hungarian law. I will listen to the next speech with pleasure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. for your speaking. Now I would like to please Mr. Laszlo Dornfeld from Hungarian team to describe the subject matter and cities deciding about content censorship in Hungary, criteria for content censorship in Hungary. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity of being here and thank you for your organization work that went into this event. It's a great pleasure of mine to be here. And I would like to uh, start my presentation on the topic you mentioned. In accordance with the Hungarian law on mass media, or media actors must carry out their activities in good faith and with clarity and transparency and respect for media diversity. However, social media is not covered under said act, which creates a legal uncertainty. The most important autonomous media regulatory body in Hungary is the National Media and Info Communications Authority, or NMHH for short which reports regularly to the Hungarian parliament. NMHH has the legal uh, ability to enforce Hungarian media law and fine media companies, including online media sites, which do not comply with the Hungarian legal provisions in their operation or conduct. However, it can directly enforce uh, or influence the content of said media. The most important governing body of the NMHH in connection with uh, media regulation is the Media Council, which consists of a president and four regular members, all elected to their position by two thirds of the Hungarian parliament. The online new web news web pages like Index of Origo have readers in the hundreds of thousands or even millions, uh, which is a very significant portion of the Hungarian population. So their impact on public opinion cannot be overstated. These companies regularly engage with the readers on social media, sharing the newest articles on their sites. The rules for this are not clear, however, as it falls outside their work as a media company and is more of a marketing activity. The leads of the articles when shared on social media are often misleading and uh, what can be called as clickbait, trying to force users to access their content out of curiosity. For example, in a recent case, many Hungarian news sites wrote about Austria not accepting Eastern COVID vaccines for foreigners to travel. However, in reality, their exclusion was for the domestic regulation only and did not affect international travel in any capacity. The NMHH has no sufficient mandate to censor this type of uh, dishonest and bad faith behavior, even if the content itself is factually incorrect. In this case, other measures must be taken, for example, through the competition or consumer protection authority. If a content is part of an online marketing effort for a product or a service, the Hungarian competition authority has the power to monitor activities of legal entities engaged in the activity of advertisement. If an advert advertisement uh, statement about a product or service is false, exaggerated, or is not included on the EU list of permitted health claims made on foods, the competition authority has the right to find the company responsible for it. There were a particularly large number of cases last year regarding false marketing claims about products against the coronavirus. It includes a case where it was falsely stated that a set of bed clothes was made with antiviral technology, which uh, 
made it resistant to coronavirus. And the company responsible uh, for the advisors <coughs> for the distribution was fine. Other authorities can step in if consumers must be protected. In a case, it was advertised that a, a type of vehicle disinfection is effective against the coronavirus, and the service was overpriced compared to normal disinfection. The company responsible was fined for uh, violating consumer rights. The most important tool of tackling uh, content online is the notice and takedown, or NTD for short, which is however not centralized for regulatory bodies to use. For example, if the sharing of a certain content uh, infringes the copyright of others, the copyright holder or their legal representative can issue an NTD asking for the host uh, for the content to be removed. However, the sharer of the content can object to this removal in writing, uh, in which case the intermediary service provider has to restore the deleted content and must notify the initiator of the NTD process. The latter then can uh, seek other legal rem remedy, uh, for example, starting a legal process at a civil or criminal court, depending on the circumstances of the offense. This proce procedure is uh, fully decentralized, which makes it all the easier for Danish parties to seek legal aid. National and international court decisions, however, have an impact on the procedure of it itself, like uh, many decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. In case the content is illegal or harmful to children, NTD can be initiated by internet hotlines. Some of them are hosted by NGOs, others by authorities themselves, like the uh, aforementioned National Media and Info Communication Authority or NMHH. In case of child pornography, harassment, promoting the use of illegal drugs, violence, racism, etc., the content can be reported to the internet hotline which will then initiate the NTD process uh, to the host of the data. In case the referred content is criminal in nature, the hotline will forward it to the competent law enforcement unit. If the content on the social media is used for criminal purposes, for example, it's defamatory in nature or denies the crimes of the national socialist or communist regimes, the accessibility of uh, which constitutes a crime itself, uh, like for example, child pornography, or it was created as a result of a crime, for example, a defamatory video, its temporary or permanent removal can be ordered by the relevant judicial authority. During the criminal procedure, the court can use a coercive measure and order the intermediary service provider or the social media network to make the content temporarily inaccessible for the public by removing it. It is similar in nature to the NTD, which I already mentioned, However, it is enforced by the state and the intermediary service provider must comply with the decision. If they refuse to comply, the court can order the blocking of the URL access to the content in question, rendering it inaccessible. The permanent removal of content is a measure in the Hungarian criminal code and should be ordered in the aforementioned cases in the judgment of the court, even if the perpetrator can be punished due to grounds from example exemption from criminal responsibility, or just simply being warned by the court. The implementation of the measure and the coercive uh, measure was met with uh, severe criticism, as many NGOs felt that it would be a tool used too extensively, which, was re which would result uh, in censorship of legitimate speech. However, as of uh, 2018, no data could be found uh, of courts actually resorting to the coercive measure, and the permanent takedown of content was ordered only once in the case of a well-known Hungarian far-right website denying the Holocaust, and even it was practically uh, unenforceable due to the site itself being hosted in the USA. Making online content inaccessible for the public is also used outside the scope of criminal law. The National Institute of Pharmacy and Nutrition has the right to restrain access to data which promotes medicine that are illegal or unapproved by the competent national authorities for the public. The National Tax and Customs Administration also has the right to restrict access to uh, data 
in this case, to websites that facilitate online illegal gambling. And also, National Transport Authority can restrict access to pages which uh, promote passenger transport services that are not complying with the Hungarian regulation on those services. In short, uh, as we can see, uh, there is no uh, direct way for Hungarian authorities to uh, interfere with uh, data and uh, censorship uh, content online. Uh, but there are measures if uh, this content is harmful or constitutes uh, illegal uh, activities or otherwise deemed uh, unaccessible for the public. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir, for presenting our topic. Um, so now I would like to please uh, Mr. Roland Shemtukiewicz from Polish team to present us next topic. Censorship procedure in Poland, procedure for territory claims in court in Poland. Thank you very much. Um, at the beginning, I'd like to welcome everybody and I'd, and I'd like to say that it's, it's a great honor to be here and uh, to present this topic. First of all, I would like to say that we have to make a division uh, on two points uh, con concerning the censorship. First one is the point uh, containing censorship based on legal acts provided by the parliament and the Polish law, <clears throat> sorry, and also about the EU, European Union law. And secondly, uh, we have the censorship based on internal acts, regulations, uh, with, like, such as Facebook, which were mentioned already. Now to speak about the uh, censorship and the procedures of person claims in Poland, we have to say that we have several acts that uh, regulate this matter. And uh, it depends on uh, the type of the procedure. First of all, the, one of the most important, and I think uh, one of the most, um, one of the cases that most oftenly happens is uh, the violation of the copyright and related rights. So we have an act, the act of, on copyright and related rights from 1st February of 1994. And according to this act, uh, of course, there can be uh, made a violation report. This violation report may, can be made to an internet provider or network administrator, and they have to react in, because if they don't, they, there may be a claim for damages that have been caused because of not taking any reaction. So they have this responsibility. And the act uh, gives some possibilities of what a person whose rights have been violated can ask for. First of all, uh, he can ask for stopping the violation, simply. Secondly, he can ask for removing the consequences of the violation, repairing damage. Uh, for example, this could be excuses or some explanations that can be put on the website. And uh, the third way is, of course, uh, a person can ask for compensation and it can either be a compensation uh, like uh, paid double uh, the right. If somebody would like to buy a right to use, uh, for example, a logo or, or uh, a movie part or something like that. So it's a, so it's a, so it's a double, uh, um, double payment he would have to pay. Or we can also, he can also ask for compensation according to general rules. Then he has to prove what damages has been brought to the person who's asking for, uh, who's saying that his rights has been violated. So that's one part uh, based on the act of copyright and related uh, rights. We have also an act of providing services by electronic means. And according to this act, also the providers and the administrators of the website have the responsibility to react if somebody uh, says there has been a violation done and uh, of course, the most popular ways of reacting are removing a content, blocking a content, um, so to stop the violation. And there's a resp general responsibility, so a person whose rights or whose uh, um, whose rights have been violated has uh, the claim and he has to prove what damages has been caused. And What's more, what's next? We have also, uh, in the Polish civil procedure, that's the third act I'm talking about, we have uh, a whole institution about protecting personal rights. And what's very important, during this procedure, we have to pursue a claim to the court. 
But we, of course, it takes some time before the court recognizes the case, before the judgment, the, the final decision is made. Therefore, we have a very important institution that's called an interim order. It's an order, the court says, uh, the courts make like a prevention order for the time of the case, for the time of the trial. And what's uh, most important, the judge doesn't have, um, it isn't written like what types of steps that he has to take. It depends on the judge and it depends on the cases on what matters and what types of uh, reaction he orders. He may order to remove a content, to block a content. He, can, he may order to put some explanation, for example, for some information. So he has uh, some, so he has some um, freedom and uh, judging in this interim order. And uh, what's very important is, of course, that the main trial. In the main trial, you have to prove your rights and you have to prove that your claim uh, has a legal basis. But when you are asking for the interim order, you have to prove the probability of the violation and it is enough. So before the trial finishes, you have your rights safe. So that's why it's a very important act and a very important institution. We have also some procedures that are connected with the criminal law. We have two crimes that, that we have to mention about. We have defamation and we have insult. Uh, and for insult and for information, a, a person can be sentenced for a fee, for public works, and even up to jail, one year of jail. So uh, a person in this type of cases has to go to the uh, criminal court. He has to go by himself. So the person who's hurt by a certain content has to go to the court and press charges. And um, it doesn't include, uh, generally it doesn't include the work of the public prosecutor. We do it on our own. So these are the claims and the types of procedures you can do based on uh, the legal acts that are um, here now working at, in Poland. And the second one that has been already mentioned, these are the rules and the procedures that are based on internal regulations on terms of services brought, which, bring, which, are, which are brought by uh, social media such as Facebook, Instagram, and as it was said, they have their own regulations and uh, only according to them, they made they may, their independent decisions about the content and about the reactions and according to their own um, regulations. Personally, I find, I find it very strange that this is not regulated yet by the national law. I hope it will be done soon. The project of the Ministry of Justice has been mentioned, so I won't be uh, recalling it once again, but it's a hope for regulating such things and it brings some new innovative ideas some new innovative uh, ways of reaction for the violation. So uh, it is important that such uh, new legal steps will be made. Well, I think that's all about the um, claims, about the procedures that can be made. Thank you for passing me the voice. Thank you, sir, for your speech. Next topic will be presented by Mr. Janos Sinek from Hungarian team. The title of the next speech is Censorship Procedure in Hungary, Procedure for Pursuing Claims in Court in Hungary. Yes. Uh, thank you for allowing me to take the floor and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about the legal aspects of content censorship in social media. Uh, so first of all, I will talk about the different types of censorship in social media. And after that, I will give you some background information about the censorship procedure itself. Finally, I'll go on talk about pursuing claims in court in Hungary. Uh, during my speech, I will use Facebook as an example for a social media platform and an example for an intermediary service provider. As Facebook is the biggest social media platform in the world with 2.85 billion monthly active users. In Hungary, the number of registered users was 7 million in April, which means that more than 70% of the population in Hungary had a registered account uh, on Facebook. 
um, censorship uh, comes uh, comes up quite often around content moderation on social media. However, I think or we think that this term might not be the best suited to describe the phenomenon. Uh, the classical meaning of censorship can be considered a state instrument. Uh, in Hungary, the last form of censorship, uh, the provision of the prior restriction on publishing a press product was abolished by the Constitutional Court of Hungary because the regulation uh, restricted the freedom of press. The subsequent censorship was uh, abolished much more earlier. Uh, this topic is particularly interesting because uh, social media and Facebook uses a long ago abolished uh, state instrument while controlling the user uploaded content or suspending user accounts. Uh, in our understanding, the term censorship nowadays stands for ex post verification of the user uploaded co content on social media. Sorry. Uh, under content censorship, as an everyday practice, uh, Facebook is deleting or hiding user uploaded content or making content less visible and also locks or suspends user profiles on a daily basis. It means that anyone, anyone can be disconnected from the online phase without any formal, transparent or very clear procedure. Uh, now, in Hungary, there are no legal consequences for removing uh, for, of non-infringing content from social media platforms. Practically, this means that Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, or any other social media platform can delete any content without any consequences. Uh, by removing a post that affects a big number of users, not only the freedom of expression, but also the freedom of the right of getting the information would be violated. Uh, without knowing the internal conditions of the platform. Uh, the previous year, the Facebook announced the, that from 1st of October 2020, the Facebook community guidelines will be amended. According to the new provisions, uh, Facebook can remove or block any content that poses a legal risk to the platform, even if the content is not illegal or infringing. Currently, Facebook's moderation system is totally not transparent. After a moderator removes, removes the content that he or she believes violates the community guidelines, the user can choose to accept the decision of the moderator or may ask for a review. For the review, no other comments can be added. If the user asks for the review, Facebook responds that they may look, uh, at, the, look at the post again, or and it's a quotation, maybe not, because their capacity is limited due to the coronavirus. Typically, even if the content is reviewed by the platform, it is a matter of weeks or months and the restrictions imposed on the user or content remain effective. It's also worth noting that often it's not people, but an algorithm that decides whether to remove a certain content a page or not. There are also cases when a user requests to delete content uploaded by somebody, which is considered to be infringing. This procedure, as Laszlo also mentioned, called the notice and take down the NTD procedure. However, uh, the nature of this procedure raises many further questions. The obligation to remove the user uploaded content by the social media platform, it is absolutely independent of any judicial or administrative proceedings. In Facebook, or in case of any intermediary hosting provider, uh, must act before such a decision of a court or an administrative body is taken, if any illegal proceedings are carried out, of all, out at all. Uh, the fact of the infringement therefore, therefore must be decided the Facebook itself, and this decision will be free from guarantees of the rule of law. On the other hand, this process encourages the intermediary hosting provider to delete the content to get rid of or to avoid any legal claims which can result in self-censorship. So to sum up the first part, uh, we can say that the classical form of censorship, which is a state instrument, was abolished long ago. Meanwhile, on social media, there is ex post verification of the user uploaded content. On one hand, because of the internal rules of the Facebook, on the other hand, because of the user requests. In, in the second part, I will talk about pursuing claims in court in Hungary. Uh, as Facebook is a private company, according to its uh, terms and policies, including their community guidelines, they can disable or suspend the user account or delete any content. The only way to get a legal remedy is to file a lawsuit against Facebook. Of course, it's not so easy. There are many difficulties to sue the Facebook management. Uh, the lawsuit can be filed in the territorial competent district court in Hungary. In my case, it would be the central district court of Pest. 
which shall deliver the lawsuit to Dublin as Facebook Ireland Limited has the legal responsibility of the operation of Facebook in the European Union. Uh, in Hungary, we have many laws that are applicable to social media. On one hand, there is a civil, li civil liability, on the other hand, criminal liability for harmful content. As uh, Laszlo also mentioned, in accordance with the Hungarian law on media, all media actors must carry out their activities in good faith and with clarity and transparency and respect for media diversity. Both in civil cases, for example, copyright cases or violation of personal rights, and criminal cases, for example, harassment or child pornography, a lawsuit can be filed against the violator or the perpetrator. The civil or criminal processes can be started as territorial competent uh, court in Hungary. Uh, if the court finds the uh, content infringing, it's temporary or permanent and removal can be ordered by the competent court. So to summarize this part, if uh, somebody wants to sue Facebook, uh, he or she can file lawsuit against the uh, Facebook management in territorial competent district court in Hungary, then the case will be the transfer to Ireland and the Irish law will govern. And thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Esther, for your speaking. Now I would like to ask our last speakers in this first part of debate to present their position in the dispute. Firstly, Mr. Marcin Rao from Polish team will present the topic. The impact of censoring content on social networks on the freedom of expression in Poland. The impact of censorship of content on social networks of pluralism in Poland. Summary. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, uh, thanks for uh, having me. And I think it would be useful to share with you the roadmap of what I'm covering in my speech. Uh, first of all, I will illustrate uh, the uh, numbers uh, concerning the huge role of social media in Poland, as well as uh, describe the phenomenon of YouTube, which becoming the most popular social media in Poland. Then I will briefly talk about the three cases where YouTube can delay or block the content. And finally, uh, I will show how it may influence and the pluralism of opinion and freedom of speech in Poland. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. At the very beginning, I'd like to share an amazing fact with you. Uh, according to this year's study, uh, aspiration of girls in Poland, almost half of uh, surveyed girls between 10 and 15 years old admitted that running a channel on social media like Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube might be an interesting job in the future for them. Being a YouTuber or influencer might it seem strange to adult people, but it's totally normal uh, for uh, teenagers. And it clearly shows how is the uh, important role of internet, which is taking place uh, of old media, and it's something much bigger than just a place for teenagers to hang out. Uh, it shouldn't be also a surprise uh, that the average Pole spends uh, more than seven hours a day in the front of his computer, tablet, or smartphone while watching TV is only half of this time. Uh, and it shows uh, how uh, the enormous change we're observing. What's more? For 93% uh, of Polish users of internet, YouTube is the most favorite one, the most popular internet social media, and it's in the front uh, from Facebook, Instagram, or WhatsApp. So this leads me to the, my next point, which is the role of YouTube as the prospective key player of all social media. And to illustrate you my point, I will introduce you some digits. Every single minute, more than 500 hours are of movies or films or video content is uploaded to YouTube. YouTube is the largest base of human cultural property assembled in one place. Uh, many YouTube channels uh, have more subscribers and uh, view, viewers than all Polish uh, 
paper, uh, newspapers or magazines combined. And also they are able to react much faster than traditional media for the current events. Of course, YouTube is aware of it. And as a good administrator, of course, must impose some rules of uh, acting, some conditions for, and uh, community guidelines. This also applies to the removal or blocking the online content, which can violate the YouTube uh, regulations. As my uh, colleague already uh, said, YouTube may block or delete con uh, online content, both comments or videos, in three cases. Due to violation of uh, community guidelines, second, uh, due to violation of copyrights, and third, due to government request or um, judicial decision. So we have less than five minutes uh, to cover all of those three issues and illustrate them with the examples from Poland. Uh, so let's get started. First of all, uh, what is the violation of YouTube community guidelines? As you can imagine, YouTube prohibits the publication of certain category of uh, content like pornographic materials, spam, hate speech, uh, scenes of violence, harassment, and uh, frauds. Um, majority of content, which is against the YouTube community guidelines, is uh, deleted or blocked by the algorithm, which is 93%. Uh, and uh, the scale of this uh, worldwide is really mind blowing. Just imagine then between October and December 2020, uh, algorithm of YouTube deleted 9 million of videos worldwide. However, in Poland, this scale is really, really small and uh, more than 1% of reported uh, by the users uh, less than, sorry, less than 1% of videos online content reported by the users is uh, deleted. So uh, comparing to Germany, you can imagine that in Poland, it's uh, from the, when we can see from the statistics from last 12 years, uh, comparing to Germany, YouTube uh, deleted or blocked 30 times uh, less content than in Germany. So as you can imagine, the scale of uh, this uh, action of YouTube is not so big as in the Western Europe. Let's move to another point. What is uh, copyright violation? Uh, as uh, my team colleagues already mentioned, copyright uh, owner uh, has to report to social media, to YouTube, uh, the address of the web page of the video, which uh, violates uh, his rights. After receiving a valid request, YouTube uh, has to check if the request is uh, complete, if meets all of the requirements, and if so, YouTube may uh, decide to uh, block the, the, the uh, online content. And however, uh, it's a very tricky one because uh, copyrights are not so easily um, to be found. And as uh, to illustrate it, I will give you an example of a very, very um, big case of the most uh, popular sport project on YouTube, which is called a Sport Channel. It's, uh, this is the most um, content related uh, sport uh, channel on YouTube in Poland. And uh, it's uh, it pretty new because it's only one year uh, old and uh, it was created by the former uh, Polish journalist uh, who left TV and created the YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, one day they decided to have a live streaming on YouTube for charity when they have meetings with uh, Polish athletes, Olympic uh, Olympians, and, and decided to all of those uh, things which they can uh, beat, put an auction, and the uh, YouTubers could, could um, pay for them, and all of this would be put for the charity. But uh, do you know how was the uh, content blocked? The Polish second largest uh, television, uh, Polsat, decided to block due to violation of copyrights. It wasn't, of course, uh, the violation of copyrights, but it was the revenge of the former journalist who were working in this 
uh, television. So um, the final of this case uh, uh, was in the court of law. So uh, let's uh, turn to the last point, which is the governmental request um, or current decision as the justification of the um, removal of YouTube uh, content. Um, uh, as uh, similar, the situation is similar as a copyright, copyright violation. Uh, and if the content is uh, found to be uh, in contrary to lo local law, might be uh, deleted or blocked. And similar to copyright violation, YouTube is checking the request. However, uh, the problem with um, such decision is another, because most of them can, uh, most of the videos which are reported in such, uh, pr for example, prosecution order or court decision cannot be found uh, because lack of information or because they have been uh, erased early. And it was the case with the controversial Polish, Polish businessman who posted uh, offensive um, or um, offensive speeches against public figures and um, prosecutor ordered uh, to YouTube uh, to block this, uh, block this content. However, it was impossible to find them because they were, they were deleted early, even if, was, uh, even if they have a prosecution order. So there are the three main cases when the content can be blocked. But uh, coming back to my main uh, question about the censorship, I'd like to consider another aspect of YouTube, which is uh, a hidden censorship. The hidden censorship, I mean, is a demonization. The monetization means that YouTube owner will be deprived of the possibility to earn money on uh, his videos. How can it be? Uh, and what is the scale? Um, so topics which are not very uh, popular for the advertisement might be uh, deleted from the main page of YouTube. And if you are not the subscriber of this channel, you will not be able to, vi to see this uh, video content. Moreover, uh, the, uh, the creators of those content uh, cannot earn money because the advertisement cannot, actually they can, but they don't want to be associated with such, um, su such topics like drugs, uh, war crimes, refugees, uh, abortion, or religion. So if you post content with connecting to all those issues, it's much more likely than it will be demonetized. However, the scale of this practice is uh, much, much uh, smaller than uh, in Western Europe. And uh, beca because <laughs> of money, of course, because the earnings of Polish YouTubers cannot be compared uh, to the YouTubers of United, the United States of Western Union. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me sum, sum up uh, my main points. So, Poland uh, is still relatively a uh, homogenical country. We don't have uh, religious, military, or racial uh, conflicts on our streets. And also, uh, the possible censorship of video content uh, posted on YouTube uh, actually from my perspective, is deleted not because of the political or ideological aspects, but may, mainly because, because of the uh, substantial level, uh, the, the hate speech, uh, the offensive language, which actually, regardless of the country, uh, hate speech and offensive language is something what every uh, YouTuber should be ashamed of. Thank you very much uh, for my time. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your speaking. Now I would like to greet Mr. Valin Kovac from the Hungarian team to present the sense of the topic. The impact of censoring content on social networks on the freedom of expression in Hungary, the impact of censorship of content on social networks on pluralism in Hungary, summary. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. I would like to thank the, the Polish team for their excellent presentations, as well as uh, to my team for their uh, excellent presentations. 
Uh, I will try to sum up our uh, point of view uh, on the matters at hand, and I would like to focus on some of the issues around social media content and freedom of speech, as well as some uh, delegate ferenda uh, suggestions for regulation. Um, I would like to first note and point out the fact that uh, social media platforms are not content providers, uh, but platform providers. They are intermediary service providers. So social media provides a platform for the distribution of content generated by users and other media companies. Uh, this means that the classic rules which apply uh, to, um, to media do not automatically apply to social media as well. Uh, the content is distributed by other entities or persons using social media, which puts social media in the awkward and ungrateful position of having to police other people's content which in turn does create a lot of tension. Uh, in resolving the issues brought up by this situation, opinions fall into two broad, uh, broader categories. On the one hand, there are voices stating that more policing of content is needed from the part of the platforms. While on the other hand, there are voices who do not agree with the way this policing is done. Uh, social media is straddling with, uh, between uh, saving freedoms at one end and uh, censoring content on the other end. Um, although some of the measures adopted so far by social media platforms resemble censorship, these are most often a part of the fight against extremism and restricting access of those who pose a danger to society. Because hate speech and violence rhetoric on social media might spin out of control and spill into the streets eventually. Nevertheless, Social media is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Self-regulation is continuously met with harsh criticism, which is why platforms have asked states to step in and introduce regulation in a way trying to shift the blame for the measures they would implement. Stopping the information from getting onto social media platforms is an impossible task. It is made impossible by the very nature of the internet. I believe many of you have uh, heard about one of the most important internet laws, which states that whatever has been uploaded on the internet for about 15 seconds will stay on the internet forever. Uh, this is also true for social media posts, which sometimes go viral, especially if their author tries to delete, to delete them. Also, it is important to note that if some people really want to spread the information of their choosing, they will definitely be able to do it through all types of different means. For example, by instant messaging, email, or other sharing platforms, chat rooms, forums, etc. Uh, granted, social media makes distributing information much easier, much faster to much more people. The advantages presented by uh, the sheer number of users on some of these social media platforms makes it much easier to spread information than just by posting it on a forum. For this reason, uh, regulatory and supervisory bodies activity concerning social media should only view larger platforms with a large number of users. While it is by choice that one enters a web page or serves the internet seeking out specific information they are interested in, social media works with algorithms uh, to show users the content they might be most interested in. One, uh, when one serves the internet, one becomes wary and exercises caution. Applying the you don't like, you don't look principle uh, is easier uh, on the internet generally. But when just, uh, one just um, runs into information on one's stream, news feed, uh, shared by an acquaintance or sent by a family member, this somewhat loosens one's skepticism. I believe applying the you don't like, you don't look principle is, um, is simply not, in, not enough on social media platforms. So the very model of their functioning <laughs> is such that they make for an excellent place for spreading fake news and disinformation. While it is hard to figure out how to stop the dissemination of fake news and disinformation, there are a number of means their dissemination can be curbed. I believe curbing the spread of disinformation and harmful content should be the task while removing content should only be done in extreme cases. Considering what fake news actually is, which is a term difficult to determine, 
uh, it is genuinely a difficult decision to make when considering the removal of such content. Regulation in this field has to be very balanced. Uh, this is a genuinely difficult task. Uh, questions would arise in any case on how would stricter regulation affect the right to express one's opinion. Will any regulation actually help in stopping illegal and harmful content from being distributed? Or should it be about curbing the spread of information of such content, the spread of such content, so that the number of people such content reaches is reduced by as much as possible? It is unimaginable that all posts be vetted before they are allowed on a platform. This is impossible and cannot be expected of these companies. But even if such vetting is to be done, it cannot be done following ill-defined terms such as fake news. Furthermore, social media uh, platforms are not the judiciary. They cannot definitely state whether or not some content is in accordance with the law or goes against it. Any regulation of social media as a purveyor of information, which is done by the state, has to be very carefully drafted so that it does not infringe upon fundamental rights. Having the experience we have had so far with the media, we see that this is a genuinely difficult question. It is very difficult to maintain a healthy balance in these issues. Education rather than regulation remains crucial in curbing the effects of disinformation. For this reason, it is my belief that social media regulation, if any is introduced by, by states, it needs to have the following four aims. First, to address illegal and harmful content online, such as terrorist content or racist abuse, uh, protection from scams and frauds, evidently, uh, uh, by imposing a duty of care concerning such content. Uh, second is to protect minors from child sexual exploitation and abuse content. The third is to protect users' rights to freedom of expression and privacy. And the fourth is to promote media literacy. Social media are not news organizations, so it cannot be an issue of censorship of stifling free speech. Free speech neither begins nor does it end on social media. On the other hand, I also believe that social media companies, being private companies, which offer up a service, should be able and indeed can draw up their own terms, which users have to abide by, just like with any other service. If one does not agree with such terms, they are free not to use the service. However, the ethical behavior of companies mandates that companies have the right to determine their own rules only within the law. The aim of such terms and conditions should thus be to avoid foreseeable harm to others. In any case, such terms should not stifle free speech. In case this stifling of free speech is not avoided, if affected users could just migrate to more fringe niche platforms, which are overly politicized and present even less diversity of opinion. This just adds to societal divide by feeding a less informed and thus a more unstable part of society. While social media platforms should strive to not stifle free speech, it must also be noted that freedom of speech is not absolute either. As Justice Holmes said uh, 100 odd years ago, a person may speak but cannot falsely yell fire in a crowded theater. It is our conviction that there are enough laws which apply also to social media, copyright laws, data protection, personality rights, the protection of a person's reputation and honor, and even penal laws against hate speech, threats, and scaremongering, as my colleague Janos and Laszlo pointed out earlier. There are laws concerning the protection of the public and of children from harmful content, which also apply to social media. So any further social media regulation must be of such a nature as to very carefully balance between the right to free speech and privacy and existing standards on illegal content and legal uh, but harmful content. If someone doesn't like a particular politician or a company or even a product, these networks allow, uh, people, allow for people to express their opinions or on the contrary to actually just ignore seeing those companies 
products and politicians, encouraging media literacy, the use of tools offered by social media to flag, report, ignore, and block uh, can also greatly enhance user experience. Short trainings using such tools on using such tools could genuinely add to people's knowledge and educate them in using the platforms more efficiently, making them safer for everyone. In conclusion, regulation should protect freedom of speech and privacy and aim to enhance media literacy, first of all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Esther, for your presentation. Uh, in this part of our debate, that was the last speech. And now we will have a short break. Uh, so see you in 10 minutes.